All righty, then I'm going to get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, you're all here to learn a new legal skill, and Houston Volunteer Lawyers is happy to be a part of bringing that to you. Um, Houston Volunteer Lawyers is a nonprofit part of the Houston Bar Association, and we provide free legal services to the low-income people in Harris County. Um, a large part of how we do that is by connecting with um, private attorneys and getting them to volunteer and take cases. So the intention behind offering a CLE like this is to have you all learn about a new legal issue and then be able to take those cases with us moving forward. And a new project that we started in December is the new attorney pro bono project. Um, it's something that we're able to do with the help of the Houston Young Lawyers Foundation. And what we're doing is we're providing CLEs to newly licensed attorneys. Um, and these are practical CLEs on issues that we take at HVL so that you can get started building your pro bono practice early on in your careers. And if you're if you missed the inaugural event that we had in December and you want to find out about it, we can send out that information after this presentation. Um, so the team here at HVL who have put all of this together are myself, but this CLE especially came together with the work of Brittany Mandarino, who is a staff attorney at HVL and has a pro bono fellowship from the Association of Women Attorneys. And then our team leader is Veronica Jacobs, who's the Director of Advocacy and Community Services at HVL. Um, and so today we are going to be learning about expunctions and non-disclosures for indigent clients. This is clearing criminal records. And to teach you today is Naomi Howard of Rustin Hardin, Rusty Harden and Associates. And with that, Naomi, I'll let you switch the screens and take it away. Thank you, Henry. So today we're going to be talking about expunctions and non-disclosures. Uh, the title of this uh, CLE is When is an Arrest a Life Sentence? Uh, this is not about exonerations uh, or getting, uh, you know, better plea deals for your clients. It's about what to do after you think the case is over. Because most of us think that when you have a case dismissed or if you get deferred adjudication and your client completes that successfully, then your case is over, right? Book is closed, you're done. And that could be the case that you are done, but then hopefully an attorney like me can come in and help with getting your client's record cleaned up. What I really hope is that after listening to this CLE, a lot of you will take some pro bono cases and help clients of Houston volunteer lawyers to get their uh, records cleared up. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am. Let's see. This is who I am and uh, the picture of me in the suit is what uh, the website at Rusty Harden, Harden and Associates shows. Um, clearly, that is professionally done. Um, the picture with the mask on is how I'm usually looking these days. In fact, a lot of you are probably working from home today as well. Um, so it's, it's not all glamour over here at Rusty Harden and Associates. And for those of you who don't know, um, this, this picture in the middle, uh, this is my boss, Rusty Harden. And if you don't know, he's a huge Rockets fan. And so um, we, we like to go to the Rockets games and 
COVID has really put a, a crimp in that. But um, let's get started today and Like any good book, we're going to have a table of contents. Um, this is just kind of to give you an overview of the overview that we're gonna do today. So we've got, what's the difference? Well, you guys can read. We've got, we're gonna go over what is an expunction, what is a dis, uh, non-disclosure, and then you know think about, think about why you need to be thinking about it from the beginning if you ever handle criminal defense cases. Uh, then go into the nuts and bolts of each. And we're going to have you get some ethics CLE credit today. So we're going to do a little bit of um, ethics. And then finally, we're going to talk about the internet and how it foils all our good work on expunctions and non disclosures. So, first off, what is the difference between an expunction and a non disclosure? Uh, first of all, uh, non-disclosures are, if you've heard the word sealing a record, that's what a, a non-disclosure is. It is a civil petition, but it stays in the court that the case was originally in. So it's done in criminal court, but it's a civil uh, procedure. And so you're going to file it in the criminal court that originally had the case. I like to think of non-disclosures, um, sealing records as kind of like password protecting uh, your, your client's criminal record. It doesn't mean that uh, some people can't see it. Law enforcement is gonna see it. Um, different agencies are gonna be able to see it, but the general public is not going to be able to see it. So that's why I kind of like to think of it as password protection. Um, on the other hand, expunctions uh, are filed in civil district court, and they are uh, a completely civil animal. They're separate and apart. They will get a different cause number um, than uh, the original criminal case, and it's like throwing things in the trash. It's hitting the delete button. Uh, so it's, it is obviously a much better resolution for your client, but the eligibility for an expunction is, is very difficult. You have to get a dismissal, uh, and we're going to go into the details of, of eligibility, but generally speaking, you have to get some sort of dismissal, whether that, whether that is from um, a pretrial diversion program or from a straight out dismissal. And it, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more when we get into expunction. Um, some, of, some of you may not know what pretrial diversion is. And so I'll give you kind of a quick down and dirty. Um, Non-disclosures have really broadened uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, you used to not be able to get a, a, a non-disclosure or to seal a DWI. If, if you got a conviction or probation. And in 2017, the legislature allowed people to get those sealed on their record, realizing that a lot of people get DWIs and because you can't get a deferred adjudication, that meant that under the current law, you couldn't get um, a non-disclosure. And so they've opened that up. You can even get uh, a non-disclosure for some um, misdemeanor convictions. But again, very narrow, and we're going to go into that a little bit later. OK, so why are we concerned with cleaning up our clients' records? Well, uh, the main reason is that even though your client has served his or her debt to society, uh, their criminal record, even an arrest, uh, can follow them for a lifetime. Thus, the title of our CLE today, When is an Arrest a Life Sentence? Because even an arrest can follow you around. But certainly, if you get deferred adjudication, um, that is like a probation. And then if you successfully complete it, you get a dismissal. 
but it's not a true, true dismissal. And so those will stay on your client's record and those records are available publicly on the district clerk's website. So you want to be able to clean up your client's record for um, housing, whether you're renting or getting a mortgage. Uh, you want to do it for employment reasons, because um, just to get hired, uh, having a, a record, even an arrest or a dismissal can prevent you from getting hired. It can also prevent you from getting a, a promotion. I have clients who say that, you know, oh, they're really worried that this arrest is gonna be on their record and they're up for a promotion, but that promotion requires a, a background check. Um, and then there are a myriad of, of collateral consequences, but one that people don't think about is dating. Um, I, I imagine, although, not necessarily more women are doing criminal background checks on men that they're dating online uh, just to be safe and certainly a you know an arrest or a dismissal or or a deferred adjudication that can be a red flag and so that might prevent you from dating but there there are many reasons um, and it's just that these things follow your client around and it's it's amazing the prejudice that people um, eat, myself included you know when we see a criminal record it um, it's it's a yellow flag at the very least so you need to be thinking if if you're a criminal defense lawyer and I, I know that um, most of you are um, are not um, criminal defense lawyers. You're probably just looking to help out and, and be a volunteer lawyer, and that is fantastic. You don't, you don't need to worry about this, but just, just for you to know, um, maybe you've got a family member or a friend who gets into, you know, gets arrested or has something, a lawyer really needs to be thinking about, um, needs to be thinking about uh, expunctions and non-disclosures from the very beginning of the case. Um, it, it really is thinking 10 steps ahead in your case because hopefully you're gonna get a dismissal, right? Like that's, that's what we're hoping. Um, and if you get a dismissal, then you can get um, your, your uh, case expunged. But um, it's, it's important to know that expunctions are arrest-based uh, what has happened frequently for my clients is they will get a um, like a public intoxication charge and then they will get um, a an assault charge say or or more often than not um, a DWI and a unlawful carry of weapon um, and so because expunctions are arrest-based, if you plead guilty to one of those, then um, you cannot get an expunction. You have to have all of the charges that spring from that one offense, that one arrest, they all have to be dismissed in order to get an expunction. Uh, we're not going to talk about juveniles today. That involves the family code, and that's just, that's too much. That's more waterfront than we want to cover today. Um, and then I also want to talk about non-disclosures. You have to think about those, um, not just whether or not to plead your client to um, a deferred adjudication, which again is just like probation, but you get your charge discharged or dismissed at the end of the successful completion. Um, but things to look out for are, um, you know, these, these things cannot be sealed. So if your client has to register as a sex offender, um, if they're guilty of injury to a child, the elderly or the disabled, um, stalking. Stalking is a very common one. Um, you only have to post twice on Facebook and uh, it annoys, alarms, or bothers somebody and uh, you could be guilty of felony stalking. So, um, and you, you wouldn't think that that can't be sealed, but it, it cannot. 
Um, and then these sneaky affirmative uh, findings of family violence. Um, you know, if you've got an assault charge, you've got to get that affirmative finding of family violence somehow reduced, taken away, because it's going to um, it's it's going to affect what you're um, able to do afterwards. Okay, so let's see. Now we're going to talk about expunctions. And this is, you're going to be filing a petition to expunge a criminal record. So you need to go to chapter 55 of the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure. And this is where you will find all of those, um, the, the statutes that you need to deal with an expunction. And I'll remind you again that um, you, you have to, it has to be, you know, all the charges from one arrest have to be dismissed. Um, and this is where I come to your, my first um, kind of piece of advice is, you know, as Ronald Reagan says, trust but verify. Um, that means you want to talk to your client about the case and you trust your client about what happened, you know, did they get the case dismissed? Um, but you have to verify that with the pleadings. And so you need to make sure, don't, don't go, you know, don't think you can file an expunction petition and just do it based off of what your client tells you. You have to get the documents um, from the clerk's office uh, if your client doesn't have a copy of those. So um, most of the time you can go to an attorney portal um, if, if you need those documents. I know Brazoria County, um, Montgomery County, Travis County, they all have um, attorney portals, which you have to sign up for because they're not allowing these documents to just be downloaded by the general public. So you need to download that. And that's mostly free. Um, there will be times where you may have to pay. Those are usually smaller rural um, jurisdictions. So um, class C, class C uh, are misdemeanor um, offenses and they are the only ones that you can get a deferred adjudication for and uh, still get it expunged. So everything else has to be a dismissal, but uh, if you get a class C and you, you get deferred adjudication on that, then you can get that expunged. Um, you need to also be aware, I know we said we weren't gonna deal with juveniles, but something that comes up a lot, um, I haven't had a tobacco use, but a, an alcohol involved um, offense. So those fall under the, the Texas Alcoholic uh, Beverage Code and uh, they have special rules and special expunction rules for juveniles. And the only reason I go over this is because this, you know, minors in possession happen all the time. So uh, it's, it is kind of good to know that if you go to the Alcoholic Beverage Code you will find your own set of, of rules for those expunctions. Um, the thing that I see that people, and myself included, when I first started um, doing these, is people get tripped up on the waiting period language of uh, 55.01. And it has like 180 days and different, you know, waiting periods there at the beginning. That is only if um, an indictment or an information is not presented. Presented means uh, given to the judge. And I just wanna make sure that everybody understands an indictment is something handed down by a grand jury in felony cases. And an information does not need a grand jury and it's for misdemeanor offenses. Uh, let's see. Unofficial deals, like I had one client get, um, it's called BIP, uh, Batterers Intervention and Prevention Program. This is technically a 
parole program for someone who has been discharged from custody after a conviction, but it is basically an anger management slash family violence program. And I've had a prosecutor say, look, if you'll just have your client complete this BIP program, um, we'll call it a day and I'll dismiss it. And that is great for the client, but something to be aware of is that prosecutors in the courtroom who are dealing with the criminal case are not always the same prosecutors who are dealing, in fact, often are not the same prosecutors who are making the decision on the expunction. So this is this BIP program, as I said, it's, it's a parole program. It does not fall under uh, government code 76.011. That's government code 76.011. And that code covers pretrial diversion programs. And I told you that pretrial diversion programs were, um, that I'd explain that later. And that is a program that is a lot like probation. You have classes to attend, you have to check in with um, the community supervision department, um, you have fines to pay. But the great thing about pretrial diversion is that you get your case dismissed if you complete it uh, successfully. So that is awesome. And the uh, Criminal Code of Pr Procedure, um, Chapter 55, takes these uh, pretrial diversion programs into account. And that's, that's all 76 point, government code 76.011 is, is, a, is an officially sanctioned um, pretrial diversion program. So if you don't have a pretrial diversion and your prosecutor gives you another option, you may have to do um, either a discretionary, because the the state's uh, attorney, the prosecutor has um, discretionary power to grant, to agree to um, an expunction, but uh, otherwise you have to wait till the end of um, the statute of limitations because um, theoretically the, the prosecutor could refile a case. Um, and so that's two years for misdemeanors, five years for felonies. Uh, which is a bummer, but if you let your um, if you let your uh, client know in advance that this is what that we're going to de be dealing with, that we're you know the prosecutor won't agree to a discretionary one, you're going to have to wait two years. Is that okay? Um, then you should be fine. But you do, you always always have to let your um, client be prepared if there's a waiting period. Um, speaking of pretrial diversion. Uh, programs sometimes, uh, so this is an agreement between your client and the prosecutor's office. It, it really has nothing to do with the court or the judge. It is completely at the discretion of the prosecutor. And so it's basically a contract. And in that contract, sometimes uh, the prosecutor will say, you can't apply for a, um, an expunction uh, before two years are up. And unfortunately, uh, we defense lawyers don't have a lot of leverage on this. So uh, we're kind of stuck with that. Um, and we can't, you know, that's just, we have to, we have to deal with that. And again, if your client's signing this pretrial uh, diversion agreement, they, they should be aware, just point it out to them. Uh, you want to manage your client's expectations. Um, oh, so pretrial diversion agreements, um, they also can contain a waiver of expunction for the DA's office and for community supervision. And this is so, I, I've seen this happen in family violence cases a lot. They want to make sure that they are aware of any prior um, family violence um, incidents. Um, because true abusers often repeat the abuse. And so they don't want that to completely disappear because it, you know, if, if something happens in the next five years, they want to be able to, 
to prosecute that. And so they, there will be a waiver. And again, there's not much you can do with that. You can ask, um, always ask, but often pretrial diversion is such a great deal that uh, you're not gonna have much choice. Uh, let's see. So I think the next thing is your respondents and oh sorry I, I skipped something there petition sorry guys uh your petition needs to you again need to have your uh court documents the reason this is important is because um you want to check all the the documents if you've got an offense report that's really good. That's not going to be available on the clerk's um, website. That's usually going to be with the lawyer who um, who did the case. And if you can get that from the lawyer, that is the best thing you can do because then and they, they can't share it with the client, by the way, because of Michael Morton. Uh, discovery is not shared with clients in the sense that they're not they're not given copies they they can view them in an attorney's office but they can't they can't take home a, a copy so if it's ideal to get an offense report not um, absolutely necessary but if you can get it that's good and here's the reason why uh, because i have had times where the court document will have one uh, number for the incident number. That's, that's what the police use. And the offense report will have a different number. And so you've got the court reporting that the police identify your client's record by one number, but the police actually are identifying your client's um, case by another number. And you just put both of them in there. You you say where you found them, and you just put both of them in there. And um, I've had that happen with a client's race, um, address. Addresses often get wrong. Um, and the reason why you want to list all those things, um, even though they're incorrect. Um, oh, and by the way, if everybody's incorrect, like on an address or a race, um, be sure to put a line about this is the correct race this is the correct address so um that if somewhere um there is hiding the correct address that will that will be there and and the, again like i said the the reason why you want to have all of this identifying information for both your client and the offense is because you want all of the agencies to be able to identify all of their records and to delete all of those records. Um, the petition, after you've finished it, you want to have your client review. Can't tell you how many times, um, you know, you'll be one digit off on a social security number, um, a driver's license number. And so hopefully your client is reviewing with an eye towards detail and um, will catch that will help you catch those. Um, mistakes. And then also you need to review it just because uh, you don't want to file any pleading um, that your client hasn't reviewed and that you haven't gone over with your client. Um, there is a verification to every expunction petition uh, that needs to get notarized and signed uh, during COVID. That can be challenging, so, so be aware of that. Um, you may have to help your client find a place to get uh, the verification uh, signed and notif notarized. So just be uh, prepared for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, you will. I like to put at the top of my petition a little kind of office use only block where the clerk can set a time and date for your show cause hearing. Um, and so that you will not you will not fill in a cause number. Um, you will not fill in the court on your petition. That is all assigned by the clerk's office. So um, 
that you want to have, you want to leave those blank as far as the court and the cause number. And then I find it's really nice to have like a little gray box or something that kind of sticks out for the clerk that they can set a show cause hearing. Uh, some jurisdictions ask you to submit a proposed order as well. Um, and sometimes you don't. Montgomery County, they want you to um, file your own proposed order, but uh, Harris County, they've got no use for your proposed order. They're going to send you their own, hopefully agreed um, order, and they don't, they don't need your proposed order. Um, in your expunction petition, uh, this keeps jumping. Uh, these are your list of respondents that you usually have. Um, you're always going to want to put the district clerk, but in some counties, not Harris County, but in some counties um, there, like Brazoria County, the county clerk handles misdemeanors and the district clerk handles felonies. Um, that you always have to put the district clerk because, as I said, it's a civil filing in a civil district clerk and a civil district court. Um, but uh, if it's a misdemeanor, the county clerk will also have um, had documents, had pleadings, have records on your client. And so you need to make sure to include the county uh, clerk in your uh, list of respondents. And, and by the way, your list of respondents is just everybody you need to notify that your client wants an expunction. And then when you have an order, these are all the people who are gonna be ordered to, um, to delete those records. Uh, so a lot of it is common sense. You just think of, okay, who could my client possibly had uh, contact with? And, and though that's your list. But this list right here is, is generally everybody you need to include. Uh, you'll see that um, DPS is one and you're like, wait a minute, that's a state agency. How does the, um, how does a Harris County District Court Judge have jurisdiction over G DPS? Well, that's by statute. Uh, so DPS has to follow the, the orders of the court. And then you'll see this one, OCA. Um, and by the way, DPS is Department of Public Safety. I mean, we, I think we all know that, but you know, it is an acronym, so don't want to confuse anybody. OCA, that is the Office of Court Administration. That is a new required uh, respondent. And if you didn't know, uh, OCA is in Austin, and they are responsible for the, um, if you go to the different appellate courts and their websites are administered by OCA, um, the OCA gives guidance to district courts, county courts at law. They basically, any court in Texas has some sort of um, contact with OCA. And the reason why they are now requiring OCA to be included is because now uh, a lot of, well, all counties, I believe, are now um, uploading to the, and I forget what the database is, but it's like research uh, with a colon between the, the RE and search. And because these documents are making their way into um, the the database that OCA maintains, they you need to let them know so that they are also deleting um, their, their records. Private entities, um, this could be like mugshots.com. Um, this could be um, this could be a um, mylife.com, anything like if if your if your client's records are ending up on some website. Uh, it's, it's helpful to include them in the order so that um, they are ordered by DPS to, uh, and DPS is the entity that would take care of that notification, um, to, to expunge that record, to delete that record. Uh, because 
I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but law enforcement around the state sell uh, arrest information, mug shots. And so those can get distributed over the internet to different private entities, data brokers. And so if you know already prior to um, filing the petition that your client's criminal record is showing up, uh, then you should include them in the petition. Um, school districts, a lot of people, I know again, we said we're not gonna talk about um, minors or juveniles, but for example, a university student or an 18 year old in high school, those, the school district is going to have uh, records oftentimes because by law, um, and this is something to know if you have a, a school, a student uh, client is that when they are arrested, that information is by statute should be shared um, from law enforcement to the school so that they can protect the students. Okay. After the expunction order, you're not done. Um, you have to uh, allow the district clerk to comply with the order. You have to let all the respondents give them time. Uh, what is interesting is that um, that there is no there is no statutory deadline for the agencies, the respondents. Um, only the the district clerk has a deadline, and that's one year. And so it's implied that everybody else has one year, but it can take up to one year. I've found Harris County is much faster, but uh, just make your client aware that it can still be showing up um, even up to a year. Uh, if you have a client that is not a citizen, please, please, please get um, certified copies of things like the charging instrument, which is that indictment or the information, uh, the order of disposition, which is like the dismissal, um, and, and then also the order of expunction. And the reason is, is that once those records are gone, they are gone. And if two years after the expunction, your client applies for citizenship, then um, they're going to ask, you know, even though, uh, you know, it's supposed to be deleted and you can um, tell people that it never happened, except if you're in criminal court, um, it's, it's still probably safest to tell um, ICE that, that it happened and that it, it was expunged. And, and I say safest that is really, uh, that's beyond my purview. Um, that, is, that is for your client to discuss with an immigration attorney. My job as the attorney getting the expunction is to make sure that the client has everything he or she needs um, in case that comes up. And so that's why I say get certified copies of those, those particular records, um, the uh, charging instrument, the order of disposition and the expunction order. Okay, so finally, the best part of all this is that after, immediately after the order of expunction is signed, your client can say that they have never been arrested. They can just deny it ever happened and they don't know anything about it. The one exception is if they are on the stand in a criminal proceeding, then they, they have to admit that the arrest happened, but all they have to say about it is that it was expunged. So that is fantastic. Okay, oh, going too fast again. Non-disclosures. Again, this is a civil proceeding, and, uh, but it's filed in the criminal court that, um, that the case originated. And Sorry, I am just, you guys, I'm going to go back one slide. The expunctions. The expunction petition. Um, occasionally, you will have a, uh, a class C. Um, this is actually not occasionally, but you often have class Cs, especially with indigent clients. And those can be filed in municipal or JP. So 
in chapter 55, there is special um, jurisdiction for municipal and J justice of the peace courts. Uh, and that is going to be significantly less expensive for your client. Um, I, I don't know a lot about getting waivers for fees. Um, Houston Volunteer Lawyers can probably help you out with that part. Um, but if your client is having to pay the fee, knowing that you can file in municipal court or JP court can be um, a lifesaver. So, all right, let's see if we can get back to where we are. No, non-disclosures, okay. So I know we're running short on time. And frankly, I'm a little bit glad with non-disclosures because eligibility for a non-disclosure is a little bit like doing a tax return or if you've ever been in federal court on a criminal matter um, doing the sentencing, uh, the sentencing guidelines because you have to go over um, in its chapter 411 of the Texas government code, you have to go over uh, the eligibility under that chapter with a fine tooth comb. Um, I still will get things wrong. Um, so so you, should, you should look very carefully at how your client's case was disposed and then check the uh, code for which, which statute of eligibility it falls under. Uh, there are generally eight categories, as you can see here. Um, because we are running short on time, I'm not going to go over those eight categories in depth. And like I said, you really, you need to figure out which one of these applies to you and then go read the statute carefully. Uh, section 411.074 is the required conditions for all non-disclosures. And this A part, no conviction or deferred adjudication for another offense from the time sentence to the time the sentence is complete, plus the waiting period, again, misdemeanors two years, felonies five years. Um, this can be tricky when pleading as well. Sometimes your client will pick up two cases, but yay you, you've, you've negotiated uh, deferred adjudication um, on both of them. Now, it is unlikely that you will plead to um, those two or and get sentenced, um, that you will not get sentenced on the same day uh, for those. But on the off chance, like something you're still negotiating on one and you just want to go ahead and get this other one out of the way, please, please, please do not. Um, because it is it is going to be disastrous for your client because they're not going to be able to get a non-disclosure. Um, because as you can see, while they're doing the deferred adjudication for the, um, the charge, they can't get a new charge. They can't get a new sentence after that sentencing on the first one happens. So that, and that's another thing to look closely at, especially if you're dealing with indigent clients, sometimes they have multiple um, things going on. And so you really wanna be careful on the timing before you advise them and get their hopes up that they're gonna get it. And again, as we talked about in the beginning um, about your trial strategy, if you've got sex offender uh, registration or any sentence with an affirmative finding of violence, you are going to be out of luck. Um, the non-disclosure petition is actually a lot easier because you don't have to worry about a verification. Um, so you don't have to get that signed and notarized. Definitely, definitely review it with your client as you would with an expunction, but you don't, there are not as many moving parts. Um, you will also not have the respondents, the agencies that your client has had contact with in the petition, but those will go in the order and you should file um, a proposed order with, uh, with your petition. So you'll want to file that either as an attachment 
or as a separate document. And this is a good time for me to remind you guys that um, when e-filing these documents, uh, there are a lot of local rules in different jurisdictions. And unfortunately, I'm super spoiled here and I don't do the filing. My absolutely wonderful assistant, Sandra Dominguez, does that. She is a pro. So if you get into any problems, I'm going to give you my contact information at the end. She and I can usually figure out how you need to e-file it. Um, so again, you want to have your client review it. Um, make sure that all the identifying information is um, correct. The clerk does not, you don't have a show cause hearing. And I know I didn't go over a show cause hearing before, and I apologize for the expunctions. Time is just running out. Um, the show cause hearing usually doesn't happen. Usually there's an agreed order with the prosecution and you pass the hearing. Um, with the non-disclosure, there is no show cause hearing, but usually the state has about 45 days um, in which to file something if they have objections, and they're the only ones that can object. The, the judge can deny it, the prosecution can object to it, but none of the agencies, once the judge has filed the order, none of them um, get that time period to, to object. Um, DPS is a particular, you know, with expunctions, they're never going to sign off. Um, the other agencies will, will sign off and usually the district attorney signs off for DPS. But if you freak out that DPS is not signing your expunction order, please don't. Um, they never do it. Not for me, not for anybody. So, and I apologize for jumping back and forth. Anyway, Proposed order will list all of your respondents. Um, you will need to get a hearing set. You will call the coordinator of that court and get the motion uh, set for a, for a hearing. Uh, let's see. After that, uh, both with non-disclosures and with expunctions, there will be times where um, the hearing time has passed, there was no hearing, and everybody agrees, and you just need to get the judge to sign either the expunction order or the um, non-disclosure order. Um, give, give the judge a little time, especially with COVID, but uh, call the coordinator after a month, and that usually uh, will bring it back to their attention. Uh, these again, and hopefully if, if you want these slides today, I'm going to, you know, you can email me and I'm happy to send them to you or HBL may make them available, but it's, it's basically the same. Whoever your client came in contact with, that's who you need to put as a respondent or as a um, agency who is required to seal. Um, under statute, the clerk has 30 days uh, to seal the record. DPS, I think, has 15. Um, exemptions, okay. So there is a long list. Um, and if you go to government code for uh, chapter 411, they will tell you every single agency that is um, exempted from this sealing order. So attorneys, uh, the, the board of law examiners, um, schools, because obviously they don't want to hire people with criminal records, um, doctors, nurses, um, anybody who is getting licensed to do like uh, broker work, like securities exchange and hazardous materials related. Um, I guess we don't want the, we don't want people to do that either. Um, after your client's record is sealed, the uh, order of non-disclosure has been signed. Your client can again deny the arrest, um, except in criminal proceedings. And then obviously, if you are applying to um, get your law license, your medical license, um, or to drive um, hazardous materials, uh, they've got access to those records. So you don't, you want to advise your client not to um, say that they haven't ever been arrested to those entities. 
Um, the easiest thing for me, um, because usually I handle my client's criminal case, is for my clients just to give me a call and you know if they are doing any applications and, and check with me. But if you're doing this pro bono, that may be a little more difficult. So I would just give them, I would, I would make a copy, you know, of, of chapter 411, the entities that are um, exempt in for sealing, and then um, they they will know. Um, for both the uh, non-disclosure order and expunctions, uh, there are civil penalties for uh, private entities that fail to comply. This is, in my mind, relatively toothless because the ones that are usually the worst are the biggest ones, uh, like the credit reporting agencies. And frankly, um, after they get note, you have to file a, a petition with a co court, so that's more legal fees. Um, the court will give notice, and then it's $500 for each failure to um, seal or to expunge. And for these big multinational companies or for companies in the Bahamas, not really, not really a discouraging. Okay, very, very quickly, because um, I want to leave time for um, questions if we can. Um, the internet is our worst enemy. Um, there are mugshots.com, arrest.com, my life is the worst. Um, all of these are private entities that buy information from, and booking photos mainly, um, from law enforcement agencies, and they have headquarters in the Bahamas. They're just really, you know, they're not transparent about how to get a hold of them. Um, and it's a scam. It's a scam that they they have places that you can click on their websites and um, they will clear your record, but that usually involves some kind of fee. It's just, it's, it's extortion if you ask me. Um, Media companies like, because um, we have some uh, high profile cases and even, you know, some, some of these, you know, other cases, even small ones can, can make it into the news if there's, you know, if it's interesting to the public for some reason. Uh, human trafficking, um, you know, prostitution, those are, those are big ones. Um, they the, the Chronicle, the Houston Chronicle has kind of taken a, a position where they will no longer um, publish those things. And that's due to work by people like um, Carrie Blakinger and other journalists who have, um, have asked uh, that the Chronicle and other media outlets get rid of things like mugshots. Um, the ethics, oh my gosh, um, the ethics of expunging and sealing. Okay, so you are dealing with innocent or indigent clients, pardon me. Um, you want to keep in mind that there is more going on in their lives than just their expunction petition or their non-disclosure petition. Um, so you've got to kind of work with them, be patient. Um, but also, on the other hand, you don't want your, these are really easy cases to let be on your back burner and forget about. Um, and it's because there's no a special urgency to them. You know, the case is over. Um, most of the, you know, with the reporting to community supervision, it's over. So it's real easy to um, lose track of these cases. And I would just ask you not to do that, to, to stay on top of it, put reminders in your calendar. Um, investigate, investigate eligibility before making promises to your client, A, that they're eligible at all, um, but B, on the timeline, you know? Um, like if you haven't seen the pretrial diversion agreement that your client signed, um, they may not be able to apply for that expunction for two years um, after they've completed pretrial diversion. Um, COVID is causing a lot of delays in the court. So it's causing delays in the court. It's causing delays for communicating with your clients. So just be, just be aware of that. Um, 
Another issue that you should consider is um, can you file a petition if your client isn't eligible? Um, I would say that fortunately or unfortunately, um, expunctions and non-disclosures are very statutory in nature. Um, I think I made the analogy of taxes earlier for non-disclosures and that, you know, the, there's just, there's very li little wiggle room. Um, I told you with expunctions, the, the prosecutor has a lot of discretion, um, but as far as eligibility, you really just kind of have to go by the statute. Um, and so you owe a duty of candor before the court. Um, but you also um, have a duty of zealous advocacy. And so I would just ask you to keep those two things in mind uh, when you're filing these cases. And um, you certainly want to think outside the box but if you, if you know your client isn't eligible, you absolutely don't want to misrepresent anything to the court in a petition or in a hearing. Um, you know, and you can certainly see if a prosecutor will agree to something, um, but you do want to maintain that, that duty of, of candor. And so I think think. Oh, resources. Oh my gosh, this is so important. So Andrea Westerfeld is a prosecutor in Ellis County, and you can go to the Texas District and County Attorneys Association. Oh, I was memorizing it, and it's right there um, on the share screen for you. So yes, TDCAA, they have a website, they have publications. You can um, go there and get an addition of expunctions and non-disclosures. I cannot tell you how awesome it is. Um, they even come with a CD, which seems so outdated to me, but they do have, um, or at least in past versions, I don't have the 2020, um, they have had a CD-ROM with templates, checklists, um, all sorts of good information. And um, I am such a geek about expunctions and non-disclosures um, that I have had Andrea Westerfeld sign uh, my, my copy. And so um, a new copy comes out, uh, usually I think in the even years because the legislature meets in the odd years. And so, um, you'll want to, I almost hate to have you get a 2020 edition, but it'll be so long before the 2022 edition is out that if you're gonna dive right in and please, please do that guys, um, that you should probably go ahead and purchase it. It's only 30 bucks, um, which isn't too outrageous. Um, and so th that's the main resource. Um, the other resource is me. And uh, here is my mobile number. Here is my address. Um, you can call the office. It's listed on our website. I truly geek out over these uh, expunctions and non-disclosures. I've done quite a few of them. Um, I'm always happy to talk. And I have less, left us with no time, but I've got time. So I'm happy to stay. And, ask, and answer questions. Um, I know that we have to, and Henry, you just jump in here if, uh, if you need to cut me off, but- um, um, If you want, I can just, you know, people can hop off now, but I can read some of the questions we have in our chat and you can answer them. I would love it. Okay, great. And I'm gonna just switch the screen sharing. We will share this PowerPoint so you can get Naomi's information if you haven't written it down yet. And I'm just gonna put up our PowerPoint so you can see the CLE information. Is that, can you see that? I can. Okay, great. Let me see now, how do I find the chat button? Okay, you know what? Uh, we've put the CLE in the chat we're also going to be sending out an email so you'll get it that way um and i'm just going to read some of these questions okay okay so can a prosecutor agree to waive the waiting period for an expunction yes 
they can, they, they have a lot of discretion. Basically what the court wants to do is make sure that the state doesn't want to refile um, charges. So if, if you can get the, so in Harris County, it's the general litigation uh, division. If you can get those guys to agree, um, then, then you're good. Um, or the appellate section in Montgomery County or one of the other counties. So yeah, they, they do have discretion on those. Okay. And then if a client is charged with a felony, but then the charges are later reduced to a misdemeanor, how does that affect whether you're choosing an expunction or non-disclosure? Obviously, the details will affect it too. Right. I, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that's, that's a non-disclosure because the only way that, I mean, so if it was reduced and dismissed, but then why would they, why would they reduce it if, you know, if they're going to dismiss it? Um, but they may, a lot of times I've had uh, cases where a felony is reduced to a misdemeanor and then they get deferred adjudication. And so that, again, that's, that's going to be a non-disclosure and, and you're going to have to, to look at that, um, case by case, right. but it's going to be a non-disclosure. Okay. And then another one we got, are bail bond companies exempt from expunging your record? No. <laughs> they are not. They are one of the, the private entities. Um, so, you know, but that is a great question because I don't usually include them, um, but they do have, um, do have some of that information. I haven't had any experience where they've been selling the information, um, but yeah. You can, you can include anybody you want. You can include me if you want. Um, I don't have any, I'm gonna come back to you and say, I don't have any information, um, which is if you call uh, DPS, they're gonna sometimes tell you, especially with misdemeanors, it doesn't make it up through the chain to their database. We don't have anything. So you can put anybody you want on that list, um, but yeah, I, I haven't done a bail bond uh, company. That's a great idea. I say do it. Okay. Henry, are you? I think you froze or I froze. Uh, one of us froze. <laughs> Did you hear my question at all? No, I didn't. Yeah, okay. if you could repeat that, um, that'd be awesome. Deferred adjudication in a case where there's injury to a child. Can you receive expunction on that? No. Well, wait a minute. So no, that's well, you just said deferred adjudication. So that's um, that is not a dismissal from a pretrial diversion or a dismissal because of lack of probable cause. If they are dismissed, and again, I wish they would use a different word, maybe like discharged, um, then yeah, de deferred adjudication, except for class C's, um, you have to go to the non-disclosure box. That is not an expunction. Okay. Um, I think that's good on questions. I mean, we're you really packed in all the information and a lot of people have stuck around after the hour. So thank you, thank you for staying everybody. Um, I'm just gonna share now the CLE stuff one more time in case you wanna write it down. Um, but yeah, thank you. We will send out the PowerPoint, we'll have the video. And so you'll be able to get in touch with Naomi. You can get in touch with us here at HVL. Um, and then hopefully you'll all sign up on our volunteer portal and start taking these cases now that you have a measure of expertise that a lot of your colleagues out there might not have. And I, I hope, uh, Henry, the Houston Volunteer Lawyers, we will do a, you know, we, we will expand on this and I would love to do a non-disclosure uh, CLE and, and maybe we can get even more into the, the geeky nerdy stuff of um, you know, the, the details and, and maybe even go over, um, you know, if you take some cases,
maybe we'll get you guys together um, virtually and we can we can go over those petitions together. So, because I That's love this stuff. Idea. Okay, well with that, I think we're gonna end it. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Naomi. It was a pleasure having you and I know I learned a lot. So thank oh, you good. So much. Thank you all for coming. All right, have a good weekend, everyone.